If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, <laughs> and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I haven't always been the lead pastor. I was the media guy for a while, and I made a lot of blooper reels. So that's what you call karma. <laughs> 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 yeah. I've gotten Anna before, <laughs> real good. Um, yeah, so that's disturbing and something I'm going to have to try not to look at on the conference monitor or the side screens. I'm going to just stare at my notes today. So if you're new here, I don't usually just read notes, but I think I might have to. <laughs> okay, uh, I just want to take a minute. It's been on my mind and my heart uh, over the last couple of days because we watch these things called spaghetti models, <laughs> and if you watch them, if you've been here in Southwest Florida for a couple of years, you remember Irma, and you remember everyone on the East Coast is like, oh, let's go to Naples, and then Irma was like, all the way over here, and we got a direct hit. So there's some encouragement. We survived a direct hit. It'll be okay, even if it comes this way. But what kind of irks me sometimes is when people start celebrating too early and not thinking about the people who are really seriously affected by these things. It's almost like we pray it over to another coast, right? Like, go over there, destroy them. You know, they're, they're bad over there. We're not. <clears throat> um, so I just want to take a minute. Let's corporately kind of pray for the people in the Bahamas. Uh, that is a category four or five on an island with nowhere to go. Uh, so we're really lucky here. Um, so let's just pray for them. Lord, uh, be with all those who are going to be affected by this storm. Uh, you were with us two years ago. You kept us safe in our church and our communities. So Lord, I pray that for the people in the Bahamas and to anyone else affected in the future by this storm. Bring them peace and show us the opportunities to be your hands and feet in this situation and share your love. All for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Again, as Alex said, we do have water for those of you who could not get water. So if you're in serious need, they went to the store, they had no water, we have cases of water for you. If you have two or three cases, don't take a case. It's for the people who could not get any water, it's there for you. Um, we just came out of a series, the Jesus League series. It was Heather's favorite, so she wrapped up. Uh, she did a great job wrapping up the series for us. We took a, lo a look at the writers of the New Testament portion of the Bible and others. So we looked at some of the women who played a part in the New Testament portion of our Bibles and then some. She had a lot of encouragement for you guys. In addition to that, a couple of things, though, we're actually, you know what? <clears throat> I'll do that in a second. Um, we're going to take questions today. Hey, Robert, can you reverse the slides? Just go with the encouragement. We'll go there. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. And don't be afraid to read your Bible. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to be taking questions. And now I'm messing with the media guys. And that wasn't on purpose, guys. That was, uh, <coughs> I'll go back to that part. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to download the app. I took in a whole bunch of questions over the last couple of weeks, and I will not be able to get to all of them in 30 minutes unless I talk really, really fast like an auctioneer. I'm not going to do that to you. So go to the app. I answered all of them there, and I put in much longer answers than I am able to give. If you're here locally, you can go on our Wi-Fi, C3 Guest, so it doesn't eat up data, and then search wherever it is that you get your apps and search C3 Naples. Download the app. It's a wonderful resource. When you get there, swipe to the right, and you'll see Sermon Notes 9119. <clears throat> I'll encourage you to do that. So today we are in a standalone series, and I'm taking your questions. This is right before we launch into the Corinthians series, which I'm very excited to get to. And we're going to hop right in, because there's a lot here. So first, questions from the youth group. What is the Passover? I'm not going to hang on this for too long this morning. And those of you who've been with us for a while know why. Because the fourth Sunday of every month, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Some of you know this as communion. And I always explain why we're doing it, the history of it. And I explain the Passover, what it is. In brief, 
Exodus 12, that's your homework today. Yes, you get homework here. Those of you who are new are never going to come back. Exodus 12, read it. (laughs) That is where we get the Passover from. It is when God redeems the Israelites from their captivity in Egypt. They're told to sacrifice a lamb, eat it a certain way, and then use the blood to cover the doorposts of those homes whose doorposts are covered. God passes over them. They're not afflicted by that tenth and final plague. Their firstborn son's dying. But it is just a shadow of things to come in Christ Jesus. He is our new Passover lamb, sacrificed once and for all. An amazing reversal, so to speak. So it's an amazing thing, Exodus 12. Look it up. Again, every fourth Sunday, we celebrate the Lord's Supper here. I encourage you to stay for that, and I always make sure everyone understands what it is that we are celebrating, what it is that we're doing. Another question. In my other home, so we have a divorced uh, family, divorced parents, my dad is a non-believer. How do I bring God into the home? Well, if you were with us in the Jesus League series, you saw an underlying theme. That was being a good witness to Jesus over and over and over again. We saw it in Peter. We saw it in Titus when we looked at him, Paul's writing to him and saying to different people groups, different types of people, older men, older women, younger women, younger men, even the slaves, to be credible witnesses to Jesus. They will know us by what? Our Bibles? Our love. They will know us by our love. We are supposed to be loving examples. So in this situation, my encouragement to this individual would be maybe your dad has things that he asks you to do, good things like chores (laughs) that maybe you don't like to do. Maybe getting off your phone for a little while, something like that. Go ahead and do those things before he asks. It's tough. Kids are like, parents are doing that. But he might say, like, what's up? What's up with, like, getting your chores done all of a sudden? Like, what do you want? Like, a new bike, you know, a new car, a new cell phone, the latest iPhone? No. This is what the Bible teaches. I'm trying to be like Jesus. Dad might say, I kind of like this Jesus guy. He's getting the chores done, you know? So be a credible witness. Be an example. Okay, so we can promote all we want. We can say, Jesus, Christianity, believe in the Bible, but if we're not acting like it, we're hypocrites. So we have to be like Jesus. We have to attract, not just promote. Very important. Next question. Did Jesus ever make mistakes? No. 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 I read your mind. I knew you were going to say that. <clears throat> you win the prize. Okay, question. That's why I don't teach at youth group. <laughs> Questions from the adults. Let's move to the adults now before this gets too ridiculous. What is baptism? Baptism is to be immersed in something. We always associate it with water only. Usually that's the way we think of it. It makes us think of water. But it's not just water. It doesn't mean water. It means to be immersed So there are two types of baptism that we're dealing with in Christianity. But baptism in water is a sign of dying to yourself and rising a new creation in Christ Jesus. Let's look at the scriptures. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. Colossians 2, 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So this is the type of baptism that John, the baptizer, he wasn't a Baptist, I think he was Presbyterian, he was very, he was very much Jewish, <laughs> he was performing on people. This was for repentance, All right, so you'll see that right in the beginning of the gospel accounts that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. He was baptizing them, telling them to repent. But there is a second meaning to baptism, which was yet unknown at that time. So let's take a look at Acts. Acts 19, starting at verse 1. While Apollos Apollos, was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. 
he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism were you baptized with, he asked them. With John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in other languages and prophesy. Baptism in water and the Holy Spirit are keys. They're necessary for believers. John 3, 5, Jesus answered, I assure you, he's talking to Nicodemus here, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is when we surrender our will to God. It makes room for the Holy Spirit. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who enables us to do these good works genuinely. It's a seal of salvation. There's a couple of different ways to view that word. One way you can view it is like a seal. Have you ever seen the old movies where they uh, put together a letter or a scroll or something like that, and they put wax on it, and then they seal it? Or sometimes they do it with a signet ring. There's two reasons for this. One, you'd be able to tell whether someone opened it or not. I know they didn't have like life lock or anything like that back then. Not exactly secure, but you'd know who it was coming from. You can forge a signature, but you would only have one person maybe with the signet ring or a seal. So it is a sign. The Holy Spirit is a sign that we are with Jesus. They will know us by these good works that we're doing. Next question. Why believe in the Bible? (laughs) Those of you who attend Bible study are like, oh, we're going to be here for a while. Good thing I brought a snack. No, I'll take it easy on you. It's in the app. I love talking about this. I love talking about the historicity of the New Testament. Uh, I really enjoy it. I have a passion for it. So here's the thing. You can go to the New Here section. If you don't know anything about this, I would encourage you to do that in the app. Go to the New Here section. Check it out. Those are the basics. All right. So one thing that's really important to know, we are in the information age today. Young people have the whole world right in the palm of their hands. And there are a lot of opinions out there. A lot. So because the Bible told me so doesn't work anymore. It's shot. We're not living in a Judeo-Christian America any longer. We just don't take it at face value anymore. So you have to come up with ways to answer the why, because young people will ask you why. Why do you believe in Jesus? Well, the Bible tells me to believe in Jesus. I have a relationship with him. What if it's not Jesus? So tell me why. Why do you believe Christianity? Why? Well, the Bible's historically correct. No, it's not. My history professor told me it's not. You run into a wall, and we can't witness. So I'm going to give you a really easy way to do this, something that's very, very easy to understand. Start with Jesus. Start with Jesus. Start with the New Testament. Start with the Gospels specifically. If you're in the Jesus League series, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, first four books of our New Testament. What we need to do is compare those books to like literature. All right, what we would call literary genre, like literature. We can't just look at the Bible and compare it to comic books or romance novels or newspapers. It's not like that. It wasn't written in that time frame or that style. All right, so without getting complicated, we can make this simple for you to understand so you can witness and for other people to understand. Or if indeed you have doubt this morning, I want to try to help you with that in a very, very easy way like genre types. So what we have to do is look at writings of another famous person who lived around that time or writings that occurred during the time the Gospels were written. I like to use Alexander the Great. I was talking to Heather about argumentation. Sometimes when you bring up too much evidence, if there are any lawyers here, you know this, you bring up too much stuff, too many points all at once, they'll find your weaker points and focus on that and get people to ignore your strong point. So when you're witnessing, one thing at a time. Don't try to throw a bunch of spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. 
One thing, Alexander the Great. That's all you need to do. Go to Alexander. Now, Alexander the Great died 323 B.C. for Jesus. Yet, nothing was written about Alexander the Great for around 300 years after he died. A lot of people don't know this, but that's normative in ancient history. And it's not a work just about him, like the Gospels are to Jesus. It's a history, a library of history, and he's mentioned in there. It is not until 100 AD that we get something like the Gospels are to Jesus written about Alexander the Great, Life of Alexander by Plutarch, 100 AD. Now, you don't necessarily have to remember all that stuff. I know it's a lot. Just remember, we don't have anything reliable written about Alexander the Great for 400 years after he's dead and buried. They were written, this life of Alexander was written around the time the Gospels were written. So there's your hint. How long after Jesus was crucified, after he died on the cross, were things written about him? About 50 years, depending on the scholar you're asking. It's pretty good. In fact, it's amazing for that time period in history, for those of you who know your history and things like textual criticism or writing, you know it's really good. We have four Gospels and tons and tons and tons of copies. So it's historical gold. It's written within a witness period by witnesses. We can't say that about Alexander the Great. We can say that about Jesus. These are amazing historical documents. More information on that in the app. I hope that helps you. It's historically incredibly credible. What is the purpose of gathering as a church? Many purposes. Communal worship, exercise of the gifts, teaching, and edification. Fancy word for building up. We as the church are Christ's body. He is the head of the church. Colossians 1.24. Now I rejoice, Paul's writing, in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So we have to think of ourselves as all parts of the body of Christ. When we are away from the church as individuals, we're complete, but as the church, we're incomplete. We are parts of his body. It's taking everything, not to make like an old school Transformers comparison. As we remember that. I don't know, do they come together in the movies anymore? I don't remember where they do that. They used to do that, right? They, they'd be, never mind. Let's go to Corinthians. It's better. The, the Corinthians 12, starting at verse 12. This is what Paul writes. He makes this comparison. For as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. So the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. In spite of this, it still belongs to the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. In spite of this, it still belongs to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed each one of the parts in one body, just as he wanted and if they were all the same part, where would the body be? Now, there are many parts, yet one body. It is all for worship and edification, or building one another up. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then is the conclusion, brothers? Whenever you come together, each one has a psalm or a song, a teaching, a revelation, another language or an interpretation. All things must be done for edification, building up. Ephesians 4.11, and he personally gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints, that's you, in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. The church is for edification and education. It is where we hear the truth of Scripture and the gospel message that saves we looked at this when we looked at Timothy. We're going to look at it again. It's important. 1 Timothy 4.13, Paul's writing to him and says, Until I come, give your attention to public reading, exhortation, and teaching. Do not neglect the gift that is in you. It was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. Practice these things. Be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to your life and to your teaching 
Persevere in these things, for by doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. We are to gather together regularly. Hebrews 10, 24. <clears throat> and let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our worship meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other. <clears throat> and all the more as you see the day drawing near Christ's return. When we come together as the body of Christ, it is our natural response to his love and his glory to worship him. So here's the situation. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's about to ascend into heaven. Luke 24, 50. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. After worshiping him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple praising God. They were continually worshiping. Next question, tough one. How could God, a loving God, <clears throat> send anyone to hell? We have to think of God rightly. God is both loving and just. By being just, he's being loving. Think about it this way. Would a judge be a good judge if he just let all these dangerous criminals out into our neighborhoods with no punishment? Think of a horrible crime, like the school shootings or something like that. Would you agree that that person should just be let go and then allowed to run around in our society? You're correct again. No, that wouldn't be a good judge and it would not be loving to the community. Justice, it's important. Now, with that being said, we have to get rid of this notion that there is any such thing as a good person. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We also have to part with the idea that Jesus' grace lowers the standard. Jesus came to raise the standard. He brings it to a heart issue. What he's saying, even if we haven't physically done some of these things, if we want to do them, we've done them in our hearts. Matthew 5, 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, Jesus says, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We have to understand the need for Jesus to die in the first place. We've done it in our hearts. We've all sinned and fallen short of godliness. So we're talking about this concept that keeps coming up. Blood sacrifice in the Old Testament it was required to atone for sins, to make up for sins. Jesus represents that once and for all atonement. As long as we accept him as Lord, he becomes our Savior. Just think about it, though. Just think about it. Meditate on it. God loves us so much. It's like the John 3.16 thing. I think we, we just kind of repeat it over and over again, but we don't meditate on it. He loves us so much that he sent his only son to die for us. Flip the script on, on the Exodus thing. Crazy. Put it another way, Philippians chapter 2. God came in human form to die on a cross for the forgiveness of sins. That's love. Picture this. I've done this illustration before, but I think it's worth repeating while we're talking about this. Imagine that you are guilty of murder. Maybe in the Jesus way, you've done it in your heart because you've hated someone. We've all done that. So maybe we're on trial for that. Maybe we've done it. Crime of passion, I don't know. Somehow you're guilty of murder. You're in the courtroom, picture that. Really nervous. Because you know that the punishment is the death penalty. That's it. You're done. Jury decides, guilty. Verdict comes in. You approach the judge's bench. Here's the sentencing. You know it's coming. You're shaking. You're sweating. So are you sorry? Yeah, now I am. 
Are you really sorry? Yeah. Here's what I'm going to do. I have a son. I'm going to execute him in your place. All you have to do is follow this probation officer for the rest of your life, do what he says. You're free. That doesn't happen, does it? Not in this world. But that's exactly what God did. That's how much God loves us. It's important to think of him rightly. Can sin unsave you? No. I was waiting for that. <laughs> sin cannot unsave you. We are all sinners. We all sin. We are trying to get better with the help of the Holy Spirit. But if anyone could refrain from sinning completely, Jesus would not have to have died on a cross. Can't be done. Romans 5.8 But God proves His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by His blood, that's that sacrifice, we will be saved through Him from wrath. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life? Remember, in our Jesus League series, we saw that Peter sinned. Might be getting low on time here. <clears throat> Mark 14, 66. While Peter was in the courtyard below, so Jesus is on trial now, one of the high priest's servants came. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with that Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about. Then he went out to the entryway and a rooster crowed. When the servant saw him, again she began to tell those standing nearby, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing there said to Peter again, you certainly are one of them since you're also a Galilean. Then he started to curse and swear with an oath, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately a rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered when Jesus had spoken the word to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. When he thought about it, he began to weep. He sinned, but Peter was still the lead apostle. Amazing. But we shouldn't abuse the grace given to us. Hebrews 10.26, For if we deliberately sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Don't use that greasy grace stuff, people. What does the Bible teach about abortion? Another tough one. In the Old Testament, we see that killing children and child sacrifice is condemned, but there's a context to that. They're for religious reasons, not for the same reasons we would be doing that today. What we do see is that life begins by God's design before we are fully formed. Psalm 139.3, For it was you, Lord, who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret. When I was formed in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. That's what the Lord tells the prophet Jeremiah before he's got to do some really hard things, deliver some very bad news. Jeremiah 1.5, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Interestingly, we see child alive in the womb interacting as a part of this story when John the baptizer's mother Elizabeth is speaking with Mary Luke 139 in those days Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting the baby leapt inside her and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit then she exclaimed with a loud cry you are the most blessed of women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt for joy inside of me. 
So, of course, it would be wrong to take a life designed by God. However, this is but one of many sins that we can commit. The job of the church is to extend the love, grace, and mercy to anyone who has had an abortion, as he has extended his love, grace, and mercy to us for all of our sins. And if you go about condemning people before they do it, they are more likely to just get angry and go through it anyway. And we were supposed to um, have Janet Custer from um, Pregnancy Resource Center here today, but because of the storm coming, plans got changed. <clears throat> we're going to have her here November 3rd. Um, I'll be talking about this more within the next year or so, is that we at C3 believe in partnering with like-minded people with Christian organizations and equipping them. We can only be good or really good at doing so many things, right? So if we try to take on every single mission ourselves, it's going to be difficult. We're a smaller church. So I believe that Pregnancy Resource Center is one of those people that we want to get behind, we want to partner with, we want to work with. They have a really good method that I'll save for when she comes. I won't Give it all away, but you can look at the link in the app. Their methodology is excellent, in my opinion, in my meeting with her. She let me know that of those people coming in to their facility contemplating having an abortion, 74% of them changed their minds. It's pretty good. Pretty good. So, in addition to all the resources we're going to try to give them, we're going to give you opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's what I like to do, get involved locally. So there's going to be advocate programs and all types of different things that you're going to see happening through this organization that are awesome. All right, so like what we do with Todd and Tracy, Breakfast in the Park and things like that. We want to try to give you opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus. It's about relationship, correct? So we want to get involved. And not everybody is a missionary. Not everybody is equipped to go overseas or do those things. But we are commanded to love our neighbors, and that's what we're trying to do here at C3 Church. Again, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the importance of the app. If you haven't downloaded the app, a lot of information in there that I just could not get to this morning. Uh, if you want to dig in more, Wednesday night Bible studies. I teach the Wednesday night Bible study every Wednesday upstairs, 6 p.m. Those of you who go to it, you know I'm not afraid to answer questions. And I'm not afraid to say, I don't know. <laughs> so that's important for us to acknowledge sometimes. I'm excited about going into our Corinthians series. It's going to challenge us. Complicated issues, and we're going to be looking at context. We're going to learn a lot about context. And we're going to be challenging ourselves. Are we any different? Again, <clears throat> about the hurricane, we're not out of the woods yet. I encourage you to continue to pray. But pray not to see, like not into another state. <laughs> All right. Prepare if you need water, if you are not able to get water. And you know what? We might not get the hurricane, but maybe you can't get water because all the water's out. If you're in need of water, we have cases of water uh, for you. Uh, just go to the info desk, as, he, as Alex said before. See Alex uh, about it. Stay safe and continue to pray for those people who were affected by it as much as you're rejoicing that you weren't affected by it. Amen? Okay, love you guys.